from the library perspective, or do you want me to begin? Um, just thanks for joining us. Um, we're joined by Christy Truitt from the Environmental Commission. Um, we have the chat set up, so if anyone has any questions, you can throw them in there. We'll save about 10 minutes at the end for um, responding to those. That's it. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Hi, Brenna. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining us tonight. And we're excited um, to be partnering with um, the Glen Ellen Public Library again. And my name is Christy Truitt with the Environmental Commission for Glen Ellen. Also with us um, from the Park District is Renee Frigo. And we com commonly or uh, routinely are partnering together to further the education within Glen Ellen um, in areas that we can take personal um, action in our homes and yards, and also um, take greater action in our local park, parks and uh, forest preserves uh, to further uh, some of these better choices for a greener Glen Allen in the future. And so we're really pleased today to have uh, Lydia Scott from the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Region Trees Initiative join us. And uh, if any of you were with us back in April, um, we did another series or a conversation with the Conservation Foundation on making choices in our backyards, in our, um, in our own uh, gardens, and some of those choices are very simple and some can be uh, take some planning throughout the, uh, the year, but this is the next step in that to kind of take those ideas and concepts a little bit further to reinforce them and to maybe generate some new ideas. So again, in partnership with the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Tree Region Trees Initiative. Um, we're really excited to introduce Lydia Scott to help us look at what we can do personally in our own backyard. So thank you, Lydia, for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you this evening. And please, um, yeah, thank you. And I also say, I wanted to just what Brenna had said earlier, if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, but we'll probably leave some time at the end of the presentation to circle back with those. Renee is gonna facilitate that session if I have to step out partway through this, uh, this evening. Thank you. You ready for me? <laughs> yes, so Lydia, sorry, okay. go ahead. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a, a series that we're developing. Um, we've developed three pieces. The first one was healthy hedges, which talks about the impacts of woody invasive species. The second one was healthy homes, uh, and we'll talk about that one tonight. And then healthy habitats, which is the third piece, and I'll introduce that to you as we go through this presentation this evening. But the objective there is to think about how we can make the environment around us healthier. And so we're going to launch into a discussion about what we can do for our homes and in our neighborhoods. The Chicago Region Trees Initiative, for those of you that don't know, is an organization that was founded by the Morton Arboretum. And it's a coalition of organizations working together across the seven county Chicago metro area. And our goal is to create a healthier tree canopy that is more abundant, more diverse, and more equitably distributed to, to provide the needed benefits to all communities in the Chicago region. And it's really important we think about this from an equity standpoint, um, as that's been uh, certainly something that's been brought to our attention at this last year um, a little more clearly. And we'll talk a little bit about that too here tonight. So the Chicago Region Trees Initiative has four key goals, and it really ties back into what um, a healthy home situation is with, from, with respect to your landscape. Because what we know is that about 70% of all the trees and the land in the Chicago region is privately owned. And so we really need to be making good connections with those of you that are landowners or even just interested individuals that can help uh, support the care and, and uh, prosperity of our region. So the first goal for us is to inspire people to value trees. And this is really important because if we can't get people inspired about it, it's really hard to get them to move to the next level. Our second goal is to increase the Chicago region's tree canopy. And we want that because we know that the tree canopy provides very specific benefits and services to the region. And the larger the canopy, the larger the benefits. The third goal is to reduce threats to trees. And for those of you that have been struggling over the last 10 years with emerald ash borer, you can understand that very well. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't have another catastrophic loss. And then the third one is to enhance our oak ecosystems. And that's because our oaks are not regenerating. And we'll talk just a little bit about that tonight. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. Um, and it's actually one of the things that has just come out in April is our census. 
but it informs uh, the perspective from which I'm coming from to make this presentation to you tonight. So the, we did a census of the Chicago region's trees in 2010, and then we followed up in 2020 uh, with another census, which enables us to be able to look at change analysis over the last 10 years, which is very important to know. And for you as a homeowner or an interested individual, um, it's important for you to know this information too, so that you don't fall into some of the pitfalls that keep getting repeated, or that you can learn from the lessons that we've seen in the last 10 years. So one thing is that our canopy has grown and we were really surprised to see that. We expected that the canopy would have gotten gone down uh, mainly because we, in 2010, we had 13 million ash trees in the region. And we expected that most of those would be gone by now. And actually there's quite a few of them left and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so our canopy has gone from 20% in 2010 to 23%. Although in the city of Chicago, the canopy has gone down. It's gone from 19% to 16%. And this is due in part to the fact that of you know, the intensive use of ash trees on their, their parkways, but it's also due to a lack of resources to keep up with the ash removals and then getting replacements um, installed. The next is that for you to know that the most common species, the most common species for us in the Chicago region is European buckthorn. And for those of you that know uh, landscaping or your tree species, you know that European buckthorn is an invasive species. Uh, it's followed by box elder and then black cherry. Now, um, if you're a homeowner, it's likely that if you have box elder, it was there before you moved in because it's not a tree that you buy at the nursery. It's uh, a sort of a naturally reoccurring tree, but is considered to be a weedy tree. And the black cherry is also a little bit weedy itself. In Chicago, the dynamics a little bit different. White mulberry, European buckthorn, and tree of heaven are their top three. And again, European buckthorn and tree of heaven are invasive species. So it's another significant challenge there. The most common species um, in the Chicago uh, region, or the, I'm sorry, the species by leaf area, and why this is important is that leaf area is what provides the benefits. So when you think about a large leaf tree, that the, the leaves on the tree are what transpire the clean oxygen for us and take in the pollution. Uh, and the carbon dioxide from the air. So when we have a larger leaf surface area and a larger canopy, then the tree can actually do more for us. And so the trees that stand out in the Chicago region are European buckthorn. Now you say, why is that? Because European buckthorn has a small leaf. It's because there's so much of it. Um, there's so much European buckthorn that it, it ranks up there in, as the number one species for uh, most benefits in, in the region based on uh, some of the things that I'll talk to you about. But when you look next, you have silver maple, which is a larger leaf tree, and then black walnut, which again, it has more leaves on it. And then silver maple, Norway maple, and white ash are the top uh, trees for leaf surface area in Cook County. And then um, the other thing that's important to note is that 75% of all, I'm sorry, 76% of all of the trees in the seven county Chicago metro area are less than six inches in diameter. And that's an important thing to know. Um, and when you're thinking about selecting tree species for your property is something that you'll want to take into consideration. Now this is in part because buckthorn is such a huge percentage of our tree canopy, but it's also an indication that the trees we have in the region are not being cared for correctly. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that tonight in order to improve the health of your landscape. Now, when we're talking about being healthy, we wanna look at the benefits that trees are providing to us. And so our trees in the Chicago region are removing about 18,600 tons of pollution from the air every year. And when you think about a little, little tiny particle in the air, it weighs virtually nothing, but you compile all those little tiny particles that our trees are taking in and it comes up to almost 19,000 tons across the Chicago region. And at a dollar value from pollution removal, it's $191.6 million every year that our trees are doing for us with cleaning our air, removing pollution from the air. Then from a carbon storage standpoint, and this, you know, you, when you think about impacts from climate change, we're looking for all the opportunities we can find to reduce the amount of carbon going into our air. Um, and trees are an excellent way to store carbon or sequester carbon. And we, we have two numbers here. The storage is for the actual structural storage of carbon. 
and that's at $3.5 billion um, that the, our, our trees are storing carbon for us, or they're sequestering about $92 million worth of carbon every year for us. And then oxygen, because we all like to breathe, is 648,000 tons of oxygen uh, per year. When we did the census in 2010, we didn't have the stormwater data and now we do, which is great. So we know that the trees in our region are reducing runoff by about 1.5 billion cubic feet of water every year, or in a, a value of almost $100 million worth of uh, stormwater uh, retention or uh, interception. And then when we talk about building energy savings and why this is particularly important is because when you're planting trees around your property, you want to be thinking about how those trees can block the sun from getting to your, your, uh, the side of your home to reduce your energy usage for your air conditioner. Or if you have evergreens, you can plant them on the side that you have the most wind um, to help reduce wind blows uh, and cold, cold winds uh, during the winter. And so our trees are providing about $32 million worth of energy savings to us. And that results in reduced carbon. So when we were talking before about how much carbon or we want, we need to reduce the amount of carbon in the air, just by virtue of having the energy savings from our trees, it's a reduction of carbon production of about $10 million annually. So the total value of our urban forest is about 40, five billion dollars uh, worth of structural value to us in the Chicago region. And that's an important thing for you to think about, especially as you, you look at your municipal budget and other allocations within your community, that without those trees there, there are very significant expenses that you would have or reduction in quality of life that you would experience with those if those trees weren't there. So it's an opportunity for you to advocate for the care and planting of trees in your community to help increase those benefits. Um, this is just a couple of charts that show you the species composition in 2010 and then again in 2020. And if you'll remember how, where I said buckthorn was the most significant species in 2010 and again in 2020, what we've seen is that buckthorn's gone from 28% of our total canopy to 36%. And in Lake County, it's 55% of the total canopy. So we've popped over the 50% mark there, which is really something um, when you think about the devastation and the impact that the species has on our landscape. Um, so anyway, just something interesting to think about there. So when we look at invasive species, and this is important for you to know as, as you're thinking about how to improve your home landscape, buckthorn has gone from 44 million stems to 63 million stems in the last 10 years. Amur honeysuckle, uh, and honeysuckle uh, together have come up significantly. They've gone from 2% of our overall population of our trees to now 6%. So honeysuckle is really starting to crop up. Black locust is another invasive species and this actually dropped in the last 10 years. Tree of heaven has also dropped in the last 10 years. Russian olive is a species that you see often further south um, of, of the Chicago region in central and southern Illinois. It's a very significant problem. Uh, it's gone up a little bit here and I think it's, you know, it's inching its way along, getting closer to us. One that I was very interested in seeing is calorie pear. And for those of you that may not be aware, calorie pear is a, a species of tree that is still available to be purchased in the nursery trade, although it's getting less and less, um, uh, produced less and less because of its devastating impacts on our landscape. Uh, but it has gone up uh, almost doubled in the last 10 years. And it's something that we're really going to have to keep our eye on. And if you have calorie pear in your, on your property, you might consider taking it down and replacing it with something else because as it continues to live and produce, um, berries, it's going to continue to increase uh, dramatically the impacts across the region. Burning bushes and other, uh, another uh, invasive species that is still currently available in the uh, nursery trade, it's gone down in the last um, 10 years and then privet has come up, um, which is also another species that's still available in the nursery trade. So what are the top 10 species by region? So we talked about European buckthorn, silver maple, black walnut, box elder, cottonwood, bur oak, black cherry, uh, red oak, American elm and Norway maple. Now keep in mind that these, this, this list is by leaf area. And again, remember leaf area is how much of the surface of the leaf can provide the benefits for us. 
So when you start to look down the list, you can see there are some trees, some leaves, some trees here that have rather large leaves. Um, some of them are rather small leaves, but that's made up by the percentage of that species in the landscape. And why this is important to know about the top 10 species by leaf area is when the ones that are circled here in red are in the Acer genera. And that means that they are, of those top 10 species, three of them are all within the same genera. So that if something comes through to kill maples um, or uh, Acer or as a whole, it's going to hurt us a lot because overall about 12% of our canopy in the region is um, maple species. And when we look at pests and diseases, um, and this is something that you want to really be aware of when you're thinking about uh, your, your property and you're walking around looking at the different species that you have, you need to be aware of what's coming your way that could potentially cause impacts to the health of your landscape. So again, remember maple or acer that I talked about, um, it's 22% of the total leaf area in the region, so it's higher for that larger leaf uh, species. But Asian longhorn beetle, which is that insect um, in the middle on the left there, um, was here in the 1990s and was uh, eradicated in Chicago. But it keeps showing up at O'Hare and packing materials. The USDA APHIS uh, inspectors keep finding it there. So it's only a matter of time really before we see it again. And it's individuals such as yourselves that have you know, a keen eye for this kind of thing. When you're out walking around your backyard or you're a bird or you're looking at the birds and you see an insect like this, you need to report it right away. And if you can get, it, get the specimen so that you can uh, let them uh, prove that it is in fact is the Asian longhorn beetle. Um, another thing that will be on the horizon for us is the spotted lanternfly. It's a very significant problem in some of the states that are just east of us. And you can see the species that it goes after, maple again, oak, uh, walnut, and then poplar trees uh, are something that this, this insect likes. It loves hops, it loves grapevines. So for those of you that like a good beer or a nice glass of wine, it's going to be a problem for the industries that are growing those plants to provide for those beverages. Um, so just something for you to be aware of. Obviously European gypsy moth is something that we've been dealing with for some time. It typically doesn't kill the trees, but it can put enough stress on them that they'll die from something else. So it's important that you keep an eye out for that as well. And then sudden oak death is becoming much more of a concern in our region um, than it has previously. So again, something else we want to watch for. Um, what's interesting too to notice is that obviously there's nothing there that bothers buckthorn. Um, and since it's one of our biggest challenges, it would be nice to have something that would come along and just kill buckthorn and nothing else. But so far we haven't found what that is. And um, hopefully in the next few years, somebody will come up with something. It's sort of like when we were struggling with purple loose strife a few years ago, for those of you that um, were aware of that or you're used to have it planted on your property, they uh, introduced um, a small beetle that uh, they spent years making sure that it didn't impact anything else before they released it here. And that little beetle has kept uh, purple loose stripe in check. So you don't see it as much as you used to. It was taking over all of our wet areas or little uh, drainage swales and things like that. And now it's not as commonly seen. So um, when we talk about uh, what we all deserve a healthy life, the, the healthy hedges is what started this all off. And it was developed in order to get people to think about uh, removing buckthorn from their properties and what they could replace it with. And one of the things that we were hearing from the, the uh, folks that do conservation at home, which is the Conservation Foundation, who you heard from recently, um, and some others is that when, uh, and even municipalities, is that when you um, talk with a homeowner about removing buckthorn on their property, first, many of people don't realize that it's a problem. Uh, not everything that's green is good, and most people don't realize that. And so when it's pointed out to them, they say, well, I don't want to lose that because that's the buffer between my property and my neighbor's property or my property in the road or whatever it is. It provides a really dense thicket that helps screen your property. Well, there are other things that can also do that. And so we'll talk a little bit about wh what those uh, options are and what you can do. But the Healthy Hedges Guide was developed to give alternatives um, and to help people make those good choices. The second piece was the healthy home landscapes. Um, and that was to get people to be aware 
that uh, they do have invasive species on their property and some of the other challenges that we experience. And we'll go into that in depth tonight because that's what we're here to talk about. And then the third piece is healthy habitats. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that a little bit later as well, because it ties very much into our oak ecosystem health and how you as a property owner can have a significant impact on improving the condition of our native oak ecosystems. So what is a healthy home? Um, what, what does the landscape look like that um, we would like to rely on? So the brochures, uh, a link for the brochures is listed here in the upper left of this screen. So you'll be able to get all three brochures there. And then there are some supplemental resources for you that goes into more detail about what, um, if there's something in particular you're interested in learning more about, it's likely that we have information for that on our website, or we connect you to others who have that information on their website. So please feel free if you have any questions or concerns um, about anything I've said tonight to uh, feel free to look that up. And then I just wanted to point out to you that this, this, develop, this uh, brochure was not developed just by the Morton Arboretum and the Chicago Region Trees Initiative. We brought in a number of partners, the Cook County Forest Preserve District, Lake County Forest Preserve District, DuPage County Forest Preserve District, the Conservation Foundation, Illinois Landscape Contractors Association, Illinois Green Industry Association, University of Illinois Extension, um, Open Lands, uh, some private landscape companies. And um, so we've got, we had a lot of input on this in order to make it the best that we could make it to just provide some good introductory information for you as a homeowner. And it was originally designed to be set up so that it could be carried out with the folks that do the conservation at home visits so that the landowner would have something tangible to look at and to understand um, after they left. So when we look at this landscape on the left, you know, it's so green and lush and those beautiful tulips out there and that beautiful uh, foliage of trees and shrubs in the background it really looks like a healthy landscape, but there's more to it than that because it often takes a fair amount of work to make that landscape look like that. And uh, not that it can't look like that with a little less maintenance, but we're going to talk about some options that may help relieve some of that pressure, um, reduce the amount of, of work and chemicals that go into this landscape and how you can support a wide range of other um, species besides humans in that landscape. So one of the first things I want to draw your attention to, and this is just a screenshot from Glen Ellen, is that your property is part of an interconnected landscape. Just because your property stops at your property line as far as ownership goes, doesn't mean that the impact of that property or the benefits that it provides or the problems that it's creating do not go outside of your property. And that's one of the, the big banes of my existence is that um, we don't have more community uh, and governmental support for the, the interconnectedness of our properties. We do for stormwater, you can't go in and uh, regrade your lot so that your water drains or your, all your, you can't drain all the water onto your neighbor's property. Um, there are other things like that, that that come into play and we need to be more aggressive about how we think about our landscapes and its impact on our surrounding um, neighbors and, and fellow residents. So this map is a map that kind of highlights this, this interconnectedness of it. And this is part of our oak ecosystem recovery plan. And the, the parts that are almost red color are remnant oak ecosystems that are still left in our region. There's about 117,000 acres of remnant oak ecosystems out of what was originally over a million acres of oak ecosystems left. So 83% of our oak ecosystems are gone. And so what we've done is we've mapped all those oak ecosystems that uh, are remnants, meaning that they were here in the 1830s. We use 1830s survey notes, uh, 1939 aerial photography and 2010 aerial photography to identify where those um, patches of oaks were. And then we put a thousand foot buffer around each of them and that's that bright yellow in the imagery there. That bright yellow in almost all instances is going to be private property. In some cases, it might be agriculture. In others, it might be a person's backyard. It might be part of a corporate campus, uh, or, you know, some other, other ownership like that. But in almost all instances, that land is privately owned. So it's really important that we educate the private landowner about the health and, and uh, condition of our oak ecosystem so that we can increase the functional size of these ecosystems and reduce the external impacts. 
And by that, I mean, for instance, in your backyard, if you have a row of buckthorn on the backside of your property and you back up to a forest preserve or to an oak remnant that belongs to somebody else, the buckthorn on your property is being fed into that, prop that, other, that other land or that in uh, the oak ecosystem that you back up to. And so it's really important that we engage and educate landowners about the impacts of these species and management practices that you have on your property so that we can improve the health of those ecosystems. Then the blue lines that you see are, are corridors. They're 500 foot wide corridors that can begin to connect these oak ecosystems one to another. And those often go through your backyard, along the front of your house, um, through a neighboring park, uh, those are all opportunity areas where we need to increase the planting of native species in those corridors to provide habitat for wildlife and connectivity to help these landscapes function more as units rather than disconnected fragmented sites. And so when you think about your property, whether you're thinking about oak ecosystems or not, you need to be thinking about how you, when you manage your property, it has a direct impact or it can connect your property to another property just by virtue of the plants that you select and how they support wildlife and other uh, services in our environment. So when we think about how we manage our, our landscapes for a healthy landscape, we also need to think about the impacts that that landscape has on human health, on water quality, air quality, temperature, and wildlife habitat. So the, the decisions that you make on your property have direct links to all five of those issues. And we wanna be sure that what we're, what we're doing on our property is the best it can be. So the first thing to think about is controlling your water on your property. And there are a number of ways to do this and I'm sure the Conservation Foundation has talked to you about this, about redirecting your downspouts into a rain barrel or into a rain garden. It could also mean just doing some simple plantings where if you have a wet spot or your, your yard uh, puddles a fair amount after the spring rains, uh, there are certain species of trees that you can plant that will help uh, remove some of that water and take it into their tissues and then evapotranspire it into the air, which has many other benefits, including reducing air temperature by that process. So be thinking as you look, and obviously this year is, is, has been a very dry spring, so it's not as obvious to see. But when you do have a rain event, just quickly go outside after the rain event and see where that water is ponding. If it's just running down your gutter into the storm sewer, um, may, it may just be running off the road into your storm sewer, but if it's coming off of your property into the storm sewer, there's some things that you should be thinking about doing, and it may just simply be changing the amount of mowed turf you have on your property and planting more deep-rooted uh, plants, and we'll talk more about that. But there are a range of opportunities that you can do, um, to, do the, to address that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. One of the things that's important to note is that native plants have very deep root systems. And I'm not here tonight promoting only planting native plants because probably two thirds of my yard is not native plants either. But I do have an assortment of them that help with some of these challenges. At the very left side of this illustration is turf grass. And I want you to look at the root, the depth of the roots on that turf grass. It's only just one or two inches. It doesn't have much of an impact on the soil composition in your, your property. And that's important to know because if with that short root system, you're not breaking up that clay soil, you're not creating avenues for the water to get in. So wherever we have these long roots on the lead plant or the compass plant or the big blue stem, those roots are creating little fissures in the soil that enable the soil when it rains to take in more water. And the more fissures we can create, the more uh, openings and aeration that we can provide in that soil, the more organic matter that we can get into that soil, the more water that that soil will, will hold and, and open up and absorb for us. And so it's really important to think about what species you have and if you can to reduce your mowed turf as much as possible and then increase the, the opportunities you have for uh, deep-rooted native plants or deep-rooted non-native plants uh, for that matter, so that you're sure that you get a good infiltration of that water um, as it rains so that it's not running off of your property. So large trees and large leaves equal large benefits. Um, size matters here. 
So for instance, a 20 inch swamp white oak will, will intercept and, and uh, mediate about 2,500 gallons of storm water each year. Or a 20 inch river birch will uh, intercept or uh, mediate about 3,000 gallons of storm water each year. And I put, I put both of those species on here because they're species that don't mind growing with wet feet. Um, and there are many other species that, that will do that. So if you go on the Arboretum's website and you put in the search box tree selector, it'll take you to a, a site where you can actually just put in check boxes and say yes or no to different things. And one of them would be, uh, you would want to check yes in the site location is wet. And that will give you a, a list of species that you can choose from that will help take up that water and, and get it out of your landscape so that your property will stay drier during these rain events um, and, and begin to help reduce some of that overland flow as well as some of that ponding of water in your backyard. So just be aware of that, that that's the case. And as we get in larger sizes, if you go to a 30 inch swamp white oak, it will be even more substantial than that. So as you, uh, you increase in size, obviously those, those benefits increase as well. The other thing to think about, and, and this here is going to come back to, uh, again, native, more of a native discussion, is the benefits for wildlife. One of the things that, and for those of you that are, are uh, followers of Doug Ptolemy, he has a new book out um, right now. He's a scientist um, at the University of Maryland, I believe, who um, does research on tree species and the wildlife that they attract. And oaks um, is one of the most uh, common and most uh, widely accepted as far as its benefits to su uh, supplementing other species. And so we have here in the Chicago region, we're part of the Mississippi Flyway. So as the birds are migrating from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere, they stop here and they look for tall trees that they can sit in and rest without worrying that something's going to come peck them off. They also are looking for species that they know have specific insects that live on them that they can get high energy and high fat stores out of to help carry them on to, as they move, you know, fly on for hundreds of more miles. We also know that some of these species that we, we plant are, are the same type of situation with pollinators. These pollinators and these birds have co-evolved over time with the species that they've found to be the most beneficial for them for habitat and for food sources for them. So it's, it's important that you have at least some native species on your property and some native trees on your property to help support the wildlife that um, is coming through. And as I was talking before about oaks, oaks are called a keystone species. And that means that they are sort of the framework or the foundation for many other species. And the species in this, uh, on this slide are species that rely on oaks for their, um, their, their lives and their support. And so it's important to know that, um, well, oaks themselves actually supply uh, food sources or habitat for over 500 different species of wildlife. And so it's something for us to be sure that we, we have at least one oak species planted on our property. And for those of you that, that don't have a lot of width for one of the, you know, like a bur oak that has such a wide span, there are now some cultivars of oaks that have very narrow habit that will provide that same benefit for you. The other thing that we need to do is think about how we can eliminate invasive species from our properties. And as I mentioned before, not all that is green is good. If you don't know what buckthorn looks like, um, this is an image of it with the berries on and there are male and female buckthorn. So um, the female buckthorn is the one that has the berries. It has a little oval leaf that's about an inch and a half in length and it looks like they're almost opposite on the stem. They're very close to being uh, opposite but they're just not quite. I think they call it sub opposite is what it's called. Um, and it's the first thing to leaf out in the spring and the last thing to hang on to its leaves in the fall. So if you have any trouble identifying it, that's a really easy time to be able to, to pick it off. Um, it's a great thing to do during the winter months when you're you know, going stir crazy inside just to step out in your backyard and cut and herbicide some buckthorn. Um, and amber honeysuckle is the same way. So there's amber, there's bush honeysuckle and um, another one I can't remember right now. So there's tardiva. Uh, honeysuckle that uh, are the three that are particularly bad in our region. 
again, the reason they're so bad is because they're very pro prolific berry producers. They create a dense enough thicket that other things can't grow underneath them. So you'll often have a hedgerow next to your house and it's not until you know, it's almost too late that you discover, well, what I planted out there, it might've been a viburnum, has now all of a sudden become almost 100% uh, buckthorn just by virtue of the, the birds eating and pooping out the berries into the, the shrub row. And the next thing you know, you have all this buckthorn that's growing in there. So it's really good to, um, to keep an eye out for that. And as you're walking around your yard, just take a look at it. And there's a million really good pictures on the internet if you want to take a closer look. There's two kinds of buckthorn. There's European buckthorn and there's glossy buckthorn. They look very similar. Um, but you'll be able to pick it out before long very easily. Um, one of the reasons that this is such a challenge is, is not just because it's such a prolific berry producer and it becomes a monoculture in our landscape, but it also emits a chemical called emodin. And emodin poisons the soil so that smaller uh, wildlife such as salamanders and frogs actually cannot complete their gestation. Uh, it it uh, deforms the, the embryos enough that they just can't survive. And so it really reduce, reduces and restricts the ability of those species to be able to exist in your landscape. It's also an area where because of those dense thickets, the birds tend to hang out in there. So the coyotes know to go look in buckthorn thickets for the birds. So if you don't want coyotes in your backyard, that's another reason to get rid of the buckthorn and getting something that's a little bit more open um, and that um, provides better food sources for the birds. The, the buckthorn berries themselves are called, uh, their cathartica is the scientific name, Ramnus cathartica, and it's a diuretic so that it actually has nutritional deficiencies for the birds that eat those berries. Another problem species that many of you may have seen is, is garlic mustard, and that's a biennial plant. Um, it comes out as a little rosette that's short and close to the ground in year one. And then in year two, it, it gets some height on it and develops these little white flowers. And in most areas, the white flowers have gone now and you'll see these little long spiky things at the end and that's where the seed source is. If you can go back and get those seed source uh, pulled off um, now at this point in the year, you likely won't get another crop of them, but otherwise you need to pull them out, roots and all, or they'll continue to generate a little seed head on them, even when they're right little stumps close to the ground. It's a great plant to get rid of in the spring of the year when your soil's a little bit moist because they just pull right out. They're low, uh, their roots are very high to the surface. They don't have deep root system, so they're easy to get out of the ground. And they're another one that has some issues with, they create a chemical um, in the soil that prohibits other species from growing um, near them so that they can make themselves a monoculture just by making the soil inhospitable to other plants. This is an image that I thought was really good. It's from Ohio State University. The two trees that you see on the left image here are the calorie pear. And those were planted as ornamental plants in this park setting. And then if you look off in the distance there to that uh, row of natural area, that's all uh, uh, calorie pear now. And it's, it's really a very aggressive uh, plant. And we've, we're hearing from some of the forest preserve folks that they think it's even more prolific in, uh, in, in invading sites than West Buckthorn. So it's something that we need to keep an eye on and uh, get out of our landscape as soon as we can. So this is the, the list that from Healthy Hedges uh, that you can go to. We have it as a poster size for garden centers. And then we also have it as a handout. So if you would like a handout, you can let me know and I'd be glad to send it to you or you can just print it right off of the website. But it lists a, a list of species here that are um, good replacements in the landscape for buckthorn. And then we have two other uh, guides on our website, one that is native species only and another that is non-native species only. So that if you're a purist and only want native species in your yard, you can take that brochure with you. Um, those are also printable on the website. It shows you images of the shrubs and gives you information like if they're deer resistant, whether they like uh, moist locations, dry locations, that sort of thing. So there are some resources there to help you. And you can just take this with you right over to the garden center and help you select species um, that you can use to replace those uh, invasive species in your property. So just to talk a little bit more about buckthorn. And again, as I mentioned, it's a really great job to do or an activity to do in the winter as a family or a community or a neighborhood. Um, it's really important that you get it out roots and all when you go to, to eradicate it. 
Um, and if you can't pull it out roots and all, then you need to cut it and you're going to have to herbicide it um, because if you don't kill it, those roots will sprout stems and instead of having one, now you'll have 20 of them. Uh, I'm not a proponent of pesticides um, and, I, and I understand the challenges with it, uh, but in this instance, there's really little to no option. Um, and there are ways to manage this so that you get as little pesticide on the landscape as possible. And uh, the best way to do it is to, um, of course, mix your, your pesticide according to manufacturer's instructions. And then instead of spraying it on the stump, you use one of those foam sponge brushes that you use to paint with, dip it into the chemical and just paint it on that cut stump so that it's going directly on the location that you want to kill and nothing else. And that's an easy way to do it and a very effective way to uh, kill buckthorn. Another thing to think about from a healthy landscape is to limit the amount of lawn you have. Um, I don't know about you, my landscaper was here this morning and it's like 30 minutes of nothing but noise uh, when they're here and then they go on to the next house and it's noise. So all day, every day, it's leaf blowers, it's um, weed whips, it's lawn mowers running around. And it's, it's mainly because of, of lawns um, and the, the amount of pesticides and herbicides that are used on lawns to keep them looking um, green and lush uh, is, is very significant. So if you can reduce the amount of lawn you have and you can do something like what's in this image where it's a lot of perennials um, or you can do something that's less labor intensive, put in shrubs and trees and things like that that are not as, um, as difficult to manage weeds in. And then also increasing the amount of mulch. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, that. Um, um, the other thing is, is that as, I, as we mentioned already that we know that grass has a very short root system. So there's very little stormwater benefit. There's virtually no wildlife benefit to it. And then there's the watering. And as we work our way through this summer, which appears like it's going to be a pretty dry summer, we're going to be very sorry that we have so much, so much lawn uh, to uh, water. Um, one of the advantages to having mulch on your property is that it holds the moisture in the soil. So when you have your tree beds or your shrub beds, if they're mulched, they're less likely to dry out as quickly as uh, exposed soil or areas that are currently in turf. It also keeps the weeds down and it also provides nutrients back into the soil so that you're not having to do fertilizers and other things like that. Um, and you can use compost that you may have uh, in a compost pile. You can use leaf. Uh, leaf mulch. The, it's often best to use leaf mulch on your perennial beds and um, wood mulch on your tree beds if you have the option. Otherwise, one or the other or both is, is fine. Um, again, limiting the amount of fertilizers and pe pesticides on your property. Um, I want to just move to this next slide because it's something that we'll start to see here very quickly. And that, that's the amount of algae bloom that we see on our detention ponds in some of our uh, more still uh, streams and, and wet areas. And that's because of the, the fertilizers that are rolling off of our mowed turf um, into our waterways. And so it's important that we reduce the amount of those chemicals. And it's not just the commercial um, chemicals, it's even the organic um, fertilizers that can sometimes be problematic. So just be aware to try to limit the amount of, of uh, fertilizers that you need on your property. And again, think carefully about the species that you want to plant so that you don't have species that are so reliant on um, lots of water and lots of fertilizer in order to keep them alive. Um, there are just some species that are not geared to grow here. Um, and, and it's, it's just a fight, a battle every day to try to get them to survive. Um, just a little bit of a word here on pesticides again. It's very important that we are careful in their use. We've had all the press over the last few years about Roundup and the challenges with that. If we're, if we're diligent and are very careful about how we use um, these pesticides, um, most of them, especially those that we buy in the garden centers are, you know, enough uh, diluted that they're not as significant a hazard, but you still need to make sure that you're following the manufacturer's instructions. You're wearing goggles, you're wearing gloves, you're wearing 
boots and things like that to keep it from getting onto your exposed skin. And then you want to be careful that you're not applying it. If you're spraying it, don't do it when you have any kind of a wind because that'll carry that pesticide onto other plants and you'll kill things that you're not intending to. And then obviously the insects and, and other wildlife that, um, that are out when you're doing this kind of thing. So just be sure to read the manufacturer's label very carefully and use as little as you possibly can. Um, we talked just a little bit about at the beginning about um, our oaks in our region. And I wanna spend just a few minutes on this because I think it's important when we think about our region and the, the health of the landscape here. Oaks are part of our natural heritage. Prior to European settlement, prior to 1830s, oaks were 90% of all the trees here in the Chicago region. And um, we we just slowly to where we've gotten to where we don't have hardly uh, you know that many. There's there's much fewer than there used to be. If you look at uh, the census, I believe uh, red oak comes up as two percent of the total. Uh, tree population in the region and the other ones don't even show up at 2%. So it's a much slower or much smaller percentage of our landscape. So there's room for us to get more oaks into our landscape and especially, uh, and not, and it doesn't just have to be oaks, it can be companion species that would be found with oaks because they'll help support that oak ecosystem as well. So if you can get hickories, plant hickories, again, cherries um, are, you know, a little weedy, but they can be a beautiful tree as well in your landscape. Um, some of the others that you might find with the service berries, which hazels and things like that, that are smaller stature trees. Um, even our, our ash and our elm that we typically had um, uh, are not available anymore. We have some of the new elm cultivars that are available. Uh, ash is not available as a cultivar yet, but I expect that will happen before too long. But look at what your native, the native uh, complement of species are and think about how you can support uh, that ecosystem. And if you get into the shrubs and to the perennials, there are many, many available um, across our region. And in the spring and the fall of the year, there are often the native plant sales that are offered through the forest preserves or the land trust organizations that you can get your hands on some of those and it helps support um, our oak ecosystems. The, the reason that it's challenging for us, even in our natural areas, is that, that um, the majority, the vast majority of the oaks that we have in the region are larger than 18 inches in diameter. There's very few in the smaller size classes. And what that means is that they're not regenerating. There's a couple of reasons. One is because they're not getting enough sun. Oaks need a lot of sun to, be, to get enough energy into their system in order to be able to grow and thrive. So in the forest preserves, for instance, they're creating canopy gaps now to allow some age diversity in their stands so that we're not losing all of our oaks at one time. We also see that maples are working their way into the landscape in our natural areas because they'll tolerate growing in heavier shade. They'll also tolerate um, uh, uh, growing more densely than will the oaks so that they're quickly taking over and creating, um, uh, changing the entire structure of those ecosystems. We also have issues with browse, with overpopulations of deer that are able to browse the, the little saplings down so that they can't get enough energy to grow. So there's a wide range of issues with our oaks and, and the challenges that they experience. And so we need to do what we can on our private property in order to help um, keep them going. So what are some things that we can do, especially around trees, because that's obviously what um, our focus is. It's important to know that your trees should be pruned once every seven years at the least. Um, you can prune more frequently than that, but at least every seven years your trees should be pruned. And they've shown statistically that it's actually cheaper to maintain your trees at, at that interval and not, not longer than that interval than it is to clean up after a storm event. And that they found that by having these trees pruned on a regular basis like that, they don't fall apart or do they break up as much during storm events because the dead wood has been removed. They have good structural form so that they can withstand some of those challenges. Um, and then it's important to know that there are some species that, that are poor performers in storm events, calorie repair being one of them. So trees that have a vertical branching on them, meaning that they're more horizontal like Norway maple, silver maple, calorie pear, uh, tilias, all have more of that vertical orientation of their branches. They fall apart more quickly after storm events than those trees that have more horizontal branching. So when you're thinking about purchasing a tree, if you don't want to have to do a lot of maintenance on them um, and don't wanna to have to clean up a lot after storm events, those are important things to think about. 
The other, as we mentioned before, is mulch. Putting mulch around the root system of your tree is really important. If you can cover the entire root system of your tree with mulch, that's the best option. And it's important to know that the root system of your tree extends usually about twice the diameter of the crown. So it's much wider than what you would expect. And most people aren't uh, willing to give up that much grass uh, to do that. So they'll make these small rings around the base of their tree, which is fine, it's better than nothing. Uh, but what's important to know is you shouldn't have more than about three inches of mulch and the mulch should not touch your, the trunk of the tree. It needs to be pulled back from the trunk of the tree. So this image in the middle is a correctly mulched tree. And then the issue of watering. One of the challenges that we see with trees is that they, uh, like for instance, this spring drought, you're not going to see that impact your tree this year. You're going to see it impact your tree next year, the year after, and the year after that. Trees don't always exhibit their uh, challenges to either too much water or too little water uh, for a couple of years. It takes a while for that to show up. So it's important that even though your tree looks perfectly fine, but if, if it hasn't had enough rain and it doesn't have enough moisture, you need to be out there watering it. So be sure that you make sure your tree gets at least one inch of water for every diameter inch um, at least once a week. So, and that means over the entire root system, you want an inch depth of water over the entire root system of that tree um, at least once a week. And if you have rain, that's great. You don't have to water, but if you don't, you should be watering that, that tree. Um, let's see here again, this is the guide for healthy homes with the website there. This is the healthy hedges guide, which I think I gave you, I did give you the, E, uh, the email address uh, location on that, or not the email address, the website address, so you'll be able to find that. Um, I wanted to spend just a minute talking about healthy habitats for a second. This guide was developed to help explain some of the conservation work that's going on um, in the forest preserves and in natural areas, what needs to take place. So for instance, the use of prescribed fire. Some people are alarmed at that, um, but it's a process that's been taking place on our landscape and our landscape has evolved with the use of prescribed fire um, since long before uh, the European settlers arrived here. Uh, it talks about removal of buckthorn and inv other invasive species. It talks about uh, creating canopy gaps for oaks. It explains some of the things that you're going to see happening in your natural areas, but it's a really good guide for you as well in understanding how to create a healthier landscape for your home. Um, not that everybody's going to do a prescribed fire in their backyard, but it talks about the, the complement of species that you need in order to attract certain types of wildlife. It talks about the native um, species that have evolved here and how they're more adapted to our climate and our growing conditions. Um, one of the things that we've done is we had an analysis done on the uh, 773 of the species of trees in our region to see how they ad are adapting to climate. And most of our native species are doing really well and will do well for a long time. They have a really, a pretty wide range of growing conditions so that they're, they have a, an easier time of it. White oak is one that is not as hardy as is swamp white or bur oak or some of the other oaks, but um, most of them are pretty, pretty hardy to these, these intense um, heat and uh, prolonged drought and inundation in the spring of the year. So just something to think about there. And if you're interested in getting information on the vulnerability of tree species to climate change, I can send you that list. It's, uh, it's available publicly. And there are some species that are not native to our area that are going to struggle, uh, some with temperatures. One would be river birds. Um, and that is one that's native, but not native to northern Illinois. Uh, yes, Sarah is another one that uh, has some challenges. So those, if you have those species, you need to be doing extra diligent uh, care and monitoring on those species. So for instance, I know with my cat Sarah and my river birds, because I have both, um, in the fall of the year, I keep a, qu a close eye on them uh, when it's it's been dry for very long or the temperatures are really hot uh, to make sure that there's adequate uh, moisture on those species so that they're not as stressed. So that's the, the main crux of what I was going to talk about. I'm, I'm glad to take any questions or concerns that anybody has. Um, and if there's something that I didn't address that you'd like some information on, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you have. Hi, Lydia. Um, this is Renee again. Uh, right now, there are, are not seeing any questions posed in the chat. So if anybody participating tonight does have any, please use that. And um, I can field those for Lydia if needed. Um, 
while we're waiting to see if you have any questions, um, First, um, again, on behalf of the Environmental Commission and the Park District, I first and foremost would like to thank Lydia for presenting tonight. It's just so much information and it's just very important information as well. And I'd like to also thank Brenna and the Glen Ellen Public Library for hosting this tonight. Um, a great platform and we're very helpful to have that. Um, uh, and I'm going to plug a couple um, things real quick as well, just because they're all related to this. So um, the past um, several years, the village, the Environmental Commission and the Park District, along with the Conservation Foundation, has been offering a native tree and shrub sale in the fall. Um, and so look for information on that. The um, order forms have not been um, uh, released yet, but that's held in September where you pre-order pay and then you just do a pickup over at Sunset Pool in the in September. And so it's an opportunity for you to get um, uh, locally grown native trees um, in, a, in, a, in an easy way. They're in five gallon sized bucket um, containers, so they're easy to fit in your car and, and easy to plant at your home. Um, we also um, the, for, the local forest preserve districts and I um, oversee management of our natural areas for the, in the parks. And we offer um, uh, usually monthly volunteer restoration work days in our natural areas. And a lot of what we do is removal of buckthorn and honeysuckle and planting of oaks. And so um, if you ever wanna help in those efforts, there's many opportunities, but it's a nice way too, to learn and understand how to identify those so that you can bring that knowledge back home with you and learn how to handle things in your own properties. And then the last thing I just wanna to mention too is that um, the Park District and Environmental Commission have been offering some um, garden tours as well. And so it's another opportunity for you to um, see uh, examples of today where we had a perennial plant garden walk over at the boathouse at Lake Ellen. And that's gonna be repeated this Saturday at 10 o'clock. And it's just giving you some ideas of perennials that maybe if you do wanna reduce your, the size of your lawn, some ideas. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we did ones on pollinator friendly plants. And then next week on Wednesday and Saturday at 10 o'clock, we're gonna be over at Ackerman Park showing you plants that do well, primarily natives in um, rain garden situations. And so there's many opportunities out there for you to learn on ways that you can probably implement some of these suggestions that um, Lydia has mentioned. Um, we've got a couple of chats, um, questions at this point. So one is, do you give input to the villages as to the type of trees that should be planted in parkways? And um, it seems like Glen Ellen is planting all small varieties, not oaks or maples, even when no wires are overhead. So we do um, provide some direction. Every community and, and every ward in the city of Chicago has a canopy summary packet on our website. It's on our landing page. And if we have an inventory for the community, we'll show their inventory to them and give them uh, an idea of where they should be avoiding some species is what I guess I should say. The other is, is when communities ask us about what species they should be planting, the, the one thing we will tell them over and over again is plant broad species diversity. So in your community, you may be seeing them going through a phase right now where they've, they've been planting larger stature trees and now they're trying to expand their diversity by getting in some smaller stature trees into that, that, uh, that framework of the species that they have. And that could be an explanation for why they're doing it. Uh, but we're glad to work with any community anytime and helping them identify um, opportunities for where they can expand their species diversity and improve the size of their canopy over time. Great. Well, right now we have um, no more um, questions uh, at this point. Um, so again, um, I would like to thank you on behalf of our different organizations represented here tonight. Um, Lydia is a, a wonderful, wonderful resource and many municip municipalities have been um, utilizing the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, um, and the Arboretum, 
for guides and resources. And it's, it's amazing. So I do encourage you to go onto the website and there are, there's just so much information. And I know a lot of different um, entities, including us at the park district are utilizing some of the resources they have posted there as we're developing um, our urban um, forestry management plans for our parks and parcels. And I know a lot of um, villages are looking and, and municipalities are utilize um, resources related to um, considering tree ordinances and, and um, you know, different things that they can provide to their private residences because the majority of trees do fall on private homeowner property. And so um, anything that can be done um, by you as a homeowner is, is very, very much appreciated. Um, so the other question that just came in was, um, are the slides that you use today on the website? Um, I can make them available if you want to post them or if somebody wants to shoot me an email, I'd be glad to send you a copy of the presentation. And her email is posted at the bottom of the page. All right, it is eight o'clock. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Renee. And thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And we appreciate thank it. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Have a good evening. Good night.